thank you all for your praise and worship today. Amen. Thank you all for your praise and worship. I know God enjoys it. I know God appreciates it. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to my favorite scripture, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him. You may be seated if you're going to help me preach today. Amen. Amen. We're going to have some good church. Amen. Pastor Simmerman was dancing all over what I was going to preach on today. He was saying, trust God, trust God, trust God. Matt, would you put up my title slide? I want to bring a few examples today coming out of the Bible. If you'll turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, it's going to be just past 1 and 2 Samuel. We're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 6. And I really thought today I was going to be preaching about salt. I had salt prepared. I even asked Sister Simmerman to make me a uh, title slide for it. And I felt we needed, to, we needed to, I needed to preach on this a little bit. So I hope that's okay. I don't plan on being long, but I definitely agree with the scriptures that we're going to be reading today. Amen? Amen. Second Kings chapter 6 and verse 24 says, Afterward, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered up his entire army and went and besieged Samaria. There was something they did back time ago, and I'm sure military strategists still use it today, where if they're trying to get into a city, you can throw all your men on that front gate and try and knock in the, the front gate doors, and you go in, there's going to be ambushes, there's going to be, you know, every corner there's going to be an enemy there trying to keep you out of their city, and so you're going to be going in, sword and shield, air, bows and arrows, whatever, and you're going to have to fight tooth and nail, lose a lot of men, and that's even if you get in the front door. They would have, they would have gates, they would have iron gates, they would have, you know, people up top shooting arrows, throwing rocks, throwing oil, whatever they could to keep people from getting into the city, and so what they would do is they would then line up around the city. Any water that was naturally flowing into the city, they would stop it up, and they wouldn't let anybody in, they wouldn't let anybody out. And they would wait. They would be resupplied by their own convoys from their homeland, and they could sit there and wait as long as those gates were shut. And what they would do is they would just wait out put these, the city into a famine. Yeah. No water, no food, nothing could grow, nothing, nothing would happen. They'd end up having to kill their livestock just to eat, and so then that's harder then to plant food. They'd have, and it would go on, and it would go on, and it would go on, and that is what is happening to Samaria today. We're reading about that today. Verse 25. There was a great famine in Samaria as they besieged it, as they caused, until it was so bad, a donkey's head was sold for eight shekels of silver and a fourth part of a cab of dung poop, or dove's poop was sold for five shekels of silver. You go on and you read that women are eating their own children just to keep themselves from starving. This famine was bad. The king of Syria had trapped them off. They didn't have anything. Can you, can you imagine being the guy going out and scooping up dove poop 
to be able to sell it. Now, here in America, we are very, 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 very blessed. We live in an economical abundance of food. I was working at a place that was north, south, east, and west of here that in their kitchen, in their dining room, it had a slogan, something along the lines of, we're here to prevent food waste. We're fighting against food waste. And you would take your dirty dishes and you put it on the conveyor belt right below that sign. And on the other side of that sign, on the other side of that wall, was a trash can full of half-eaten food that people were dumping out. And I'm, I'm like, okay, hang on, that's a little backwards here. Fighting against food waste and you're just throwing it all in the garbage to take it out, pitch it in the landfill. But I know there are a lot of code violations and health safety things, and it's good to have those things, but it just seemed a little counterintuitive backwards to me. Yeah. But I say all that to say, as Americans, we might have a little bit of a difficult time picturing this, imagining a famine that was so bad people were eating bird poop just to have something in their bellies. Now, I've been hungry before, but I've never thought, man, I wish a bird would fly overhead, yeah. right? Yeah. Everybody with me? Yeah. We might find it difficult to picture and imagine a famine of this level, but we're going to try. It was so bad that if you continue on to chapter 7, verse 1... Elisha replied, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a say of the finest flour will sell for a shekel and two says of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. People had not even thought about flour and barley. Those, those were gone a long time ago. People were selling anything they could to eat, get, a hand, get their hands on it. And so the word of God has come and it says, hey, everything's going to be back to normal, if you want to say it that way. Yeah. Everything's going to be back to normal. Restaurants are going to open back up and it's going to be great. Verse 20, or verse 2, I mean. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, hold on a second, even if God were to open up the heavens, could this really happen? If God were to open up the floodgates, is that even possible? That's how depraved, that's how low these people were. That when the man of God came and said, 24 hours, God said, hold on, 24 more hours, and everything's going to be back to normal. That somebody said, yeah, right. That... Okay, uh-huh, I'll believe it when I see it. And Elisha said, you'll see it with your own eyes, but you're not going to eat any of it because you doubted God. Ooh, 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 okay. Now, who has a family member or a friend that is a little crazy? Right? <laughs> they got some crazy ideas sometimes. You, you, you hear them say something, and you're like, that's completely crazy, but you're not far off. I hear what you're saying. I don't like it, but I kind of agree with it. Well, just outside of this city that was in this terrible famine, just outside of Samaria... There were some crazy people. You'd go down to verse 3. There were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate, and they said unto each other, why are we going to sit around here? Why are we just going to sit around here and wait till we die? Say, if we go into the city, the famine's going to kill us and we're going to die. If we stay here, we're going to starve and we're going to die. So, 
you know what, let's just go to the enemy camp. Because the worst that's going to happen is we're going to walk up into camp, they're going to say, enemy, leprosy, whatever, and they're going to kill us on the spot, and that's a quick and painless death. You know, maybe, maybe if we surrender, they'll spare us. And we live, but, you know, if they kill us, then we die. So we go inside, we die. We stay here, we die. We go over there, maybe they'll spare us and we can have something to eat. So they got up, verse 5. They reached the edge of the camp where there should be some spotters, where there should be some sentries, where there should be some people kind of keeping guard. They reached the edge of the camp, and there was no one there. There wasn't a single person in sight. Because... Verse 6, the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses, the sound of a great army. So they said to one another, hold on a second, the king of Israel has hired out, and they're coming to kill us. We got to get out of here now. And so they left the camp, and they ran for their lives. So now this is morning time. The word of God spoke yesterday, said you've got 24 more hours, hold on, it's almost done. Morning time, they wake up, everybody inside the city looks out, and they still see tents. Bible says that they left everything. They left donkeys, they left everything. They were running for their lives. And so they look out, the people inside the city look out and see the enemy camp still set up. Tents, donkeys, horses. They might even see a few fires starting to fizzle out from the night before. And they think, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. The people inside starving, seeing the remnants of an army, what looks like a big show of force because they couldn't actually see it and they had no hope. Just outside, though, was their salvation. The enemy camp that morning was no more than a facade. The enemy camp was completely empty, but it looked full. See, this is, this is how the enemy works. This is how the enemy works. You, you look out and you see the problems. You see the troubles. You see the situation that you're in. You see, man, my finances are going rough. You see, man, my family just doesn't hear me. You see the problems. I'm just not going to be able to find a new job. Whatever the case may be. And you see all the problems. And the enemy likes to play on that. The enemy likes to play on that. Let's go into emotions. The the enemy will play on our emotions. I know emotions are a strong feeling, and we feel like they're our own because they come from inside of us sometimes. But that's not always the case. Emotions are just our bodies reacting to what's going on around us. And so we need to be able to keep a level head. No matter what we're feeling, no matter what we're seeing, Keep calm and trust God. Keep calm and trust God. Because sometimes things happen and we don't know what God's doing in the background. We don't know that God spent the morning out there with coconuts and other things making a bunch of noise. (laughs) Making it so the enemy's taken off running with their tail between their legs. We don't always know what's going on in the background. All we have to do is keep calm and trust God. Keep calm and trust God. Can I pick on you, Wyatt? Okay, good. (laughs) An example of this today. There was a couple years ago, Pastor Simmerman comes over to my house just after church, and he's frustrated. 
He's upset because he's got a low tire. They must have hit something, you know, nail, or some kid was letting air out of the tire. I don't remember. Something, Aubriel. <laughs> and this was before Aubriel, actually. This was back when you guys lived in Glenville. And they come over. They're saying, hey, can we borrow your air compressor? Of course. you got. And, you know, the, nothing in town was open. They were trying to find something. They come over. He's exhausted. He's got to go to work tomorrow. And so we're airing up the tire with my little dinky air compressor <laughs> that takes forever to air up. Took a half hour, probably, yeah. especially with the 11 goodbyes. Yeah. You know. You know how that goes. And they take off leaving. Got home safe, you know, no big deal. Until, I think we found out Sunday, there was a nasty semi-truck pileup on their ride, or on their road home that happened about the time that you would have been driving home. And so at the time, we can seem really frustrated about something. We can seem really upset about something. I'm not, okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit of something about, I'm going to pick on me now. I spent probably six months, eight months or more saying, God, I need, I need some help getting my finances straightened out. I need to make sure that I'm doing a good job, being a good steward with my money. Something came along that cut our financial budget down to the bare minimum, it feels like. And I'm sitting there frustrated, saying, hold on a second. We were doing good. Now I'm having to cut my ice cream budget down. And you know, I, I like my ice cream. And so, and I, I, it wasn't until this week that I realized, oh, hey, God's answering my prayer. Sometimes we don't always know what's going on. But we got to keep calm and trust God. Because sometimes there's a semi-truck pile up that we're being kept out of. Sometimes there's something going on in the background that we might not see until we've already been there, or until we're at the end and we can say, oh, God, you were here the whole time. Yeah. Samaria. The four lepers that had found the camp, they go in, they start going through, eating their fill, finding gold, finding valuable clothes. They were finding Gucci. They were, everything, it was great. And they realized a couple hours after this, they were like, oh, hold on a second, we're out here having a party Everybody else in the city is starving. We better go tell them. So they go in and they tell them. And <laughs> the people, of course, were a little leery at first. So they sent out uh, verse 15. They sent out somebody to go investigate this. Like, okay, the, the camp, obviously the enemy has left the camp knowing we'd be desperate. And they're going to wait till everybody comes out. And starts munching on the food, and then they're just going to tackle us and kill us then. So they go looking, and they start following this trail that the enemy left. They had woke up and started taking off running. And because their armor was slowing them down, they were getting rid of anything and everything that was slowing them down, just trying to get away with their lives. They had thrown everything out. And so the messengers returned to the king, verse 16, and the people went out and plundered the camp. They went out and they got food. They got whatever. They were finding everything they could. They found flour. They found barley. They found the famine was over. And the finest flour sold for a shekel. And two says of barley sold for a shekel. Just as the Lord had said. And the officer, verse 17, on whose arm... The king leaned on, was in charge of the gate. He was in charge of keeping the gate closed, and when it was time to get out to the camp, he was the one in charge of opening that gate. And everybody was so hungry. Anybody ever been in a crowd that's moving one way, and you're trying to go another way? It don't really happen. You could be tall like me, able to see over the crowd, able to try and push through people, it still don't happen. And the guy was ended up trampled and killed. So he got to see salvation. He got to see deliverance. But because of his doubt, keep calm, trust God. See, sometimes God tells us, 
hey, you need to build a boat. Sometimes God says, hey, you need to go to Nineveh. Sometimes God gives us the directions on what we need to do. And sometimes we just got to trust God. If you have not been given the exact coordinates of what you need to do, keep calm and trust God. Amen. Amen. Example number two, Jerusalem. 2 Kings 18, if you turn with me. Verse 28. Then the Rabshakeh stood and called in a loud voice in the language of Judah, or in Hebrew. We're jumping right in the middle of this. Jerusalem has been besieged. They're in a famine. Everything's looking bleak. And the enemy king comes up and he starts yelling in the language of Judah, in Hebrew. Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria, the enemy. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you. Hezekiah is the king of Jerusalem. And he's yelling to all the people, don't let your king deceive you. He will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Hmm. Hmm. Verse 30. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the king of the hand of Assyria. He goes on to say in, ver in chapter 19, verse 10, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, not just to the people. He's saying it directly to the king. Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you. Don't trust in your God. Don't let your God trick you into thinking that you're going to be able to get out of this situation. We've got you closed off. You're not getting any water, you're not getting any food, you're not getting any supplies. You're going to stay in there and starve and die, or you're going to open up the doors and we're going to take it by force. Don't let your God trick you into thinking that you will be able to get out of this situation, Hezekiah. Verse 11, Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands around you, devoting them to destruction. That's a really interesting way to say that. And you think you are going to be delivered? Listen up, Hezekiah. Look around at the situation. Look around at what's going on around you. Don't pay attention to God. Don't pay attention to your God. He can't save you from my hand. Have the gods of the nations delivered them? The nations that my fathers destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Reza, the people of Eden, who were in Tel something or another? <laughs> do you really think your God will be able to do anything different? Verse 13, where's the king of Hameth, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Zephyrim, the king of Hannah, or the king of Iva? See, this, this is how the enemy works. Oh, yeah, right. This is how the enemy works. Oh, yeah. Get you so focused on the problem. Get you so focused on what's happened before. How many times have you been in a troubling situation and your mind starts automatically realizing, you know, this same situation happened to my friend and it didn't turn out good for them. This same situation happened to an acquaintance of mine and now they're dead. You know, whatever. I'm trying, not to be, I'm trying not to pick up specifics because I don't want anybody feeling like I'm picking on them. But whether it be finances and people just go off the deep end, whether it be marital issues and somebody just loses it and can't handle it anymore, those things start playing in your mind because that's what the enemy wants us to focus on. Yeah. God can't help me now. God can't help me now because, you know, I've seen this before. I've seen this happen before to so-and-so. They ended up taking their own life because they were in a situation like I was. I've seen this happen before. Man, 
I just don't see a way out of this. Okay, so sometimes God's working in the background. And sometimes God's going to show us what's up right in front of our eyes. See, John 10 and 10 says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and they have it more abundantly. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? That means if the enemy is speaking, it's because he's trying to destroy you. If the enemy is talking to you, it's because he wants to see you dead. If the enemy is planting stuff in your head, it's only just trying to lead you to destruction. Amen? When he says, don't listen to God, Hezekiah, don't listen to your God. Don't let your God trick you. Mind games. Mind games. Mm -hmm. With the enemy is speaking, he is trying to destroy you. Yeah. Chapter 19, verse 32. The man of God starts speaking and says, Therefore, so, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, the enemy king. He's not going to step foot in this city. He's not going to shoot an arrow there. Or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came is the way he's going to return. This city, and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend it to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And that night, an angel came down, verse 35. An angel of the Lord went down and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people woke up the next morning, early in the morning, they looked around and they saw their friends, their buddies, their companions dead all around them. What a devastating defeat. They've set up camp. They've set up, they've blocked off the water, they've blocked off supplies. The people inside were getting real close. They could feel it. They could taste victory. And it was getting bad. Things were getting rough. And God steps in and says, you know what? Enough is enough. Yeah. Yeah. And they woke up completely defeated. Completely defeated. Verse 36. Then the king of Assyria departed. I've lost my army. I've lost my champs. He goes back the same way he returned. Or he returns the same way he came. He goes back the same way he came. He went home to Nineveh, verse 37. And as he was worshiping in the house of his God, his two sons come up. And kill him. Yeah, I know, right? So the enemy, I, I think this is hysterical. <laughs> right? Okay, no, not the killing part. <laughs> I should be a little more clear. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I think it's hysterical that this is the guy who was saying, Hezekiah, don't trust in your God. Your God can't save you from me. Your God can't save you from my army. Look around you. Look around at what's going on before. I've always come in, I've always set my foot in, and that was it. And he ends up getting defeated without Hezekiah having to lift a finger. And he goes home to his God. Little G. He goes back to what he knows. He goes back to what he trusts. And it ends up betraying him. His own family ends up betraying him. Keep calm. Trust God. Sometimes stuff's going on in the background and we, we just need to trust God. Sometimes God's saying, you know what, sit back, I got this. And we get to watch it unfold in front of our very eyes. But you know what we need to do all of the time? 
trust him and praise God. And at midnight, Acts chapter 6, 6, 16, sorry. Acts chapter 16. We're going to go to verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And all at once the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Everybody was set free. Because two people were sitting in there saying, yeah, I'm in prison. Yeah, right now it kind of stinks. But I know God's in control. Just because I'm in the down and the low right now doesn't mean that God has forgotten about me. Doesn't mean that God has stopped working. God is still worthy of my praise. God is still worthy of my worship. And it's the same way. It doesn't matter how we're feeling. It doesn't matter what's going on in our lives. God is still worthy of our praise and our worship. Amen. Can we all stand? I know we don't have live music, but I wonder if we could all praise and worship God. Faith, will you lead us in amazing grace? (laughs) Everyone's going to sing. Everybody's singing with us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. God is good all the time. Keep calm. Trust God. Let's pray for the food and the fellowship that we're about to have. Lord Almighty, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you. We thank you for always being there for us. And God, I pray that you touch this food, bless this food that we're about to eat, and bless this fellowship that we're about to have. Help us to have a good time. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen, and we have a birthday. Yes, we do. Uh Uh-huh. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus here every day.